Welcome to episode 50 of the How to Japanese podcast. It's April 2024. We made it. Otsukare uh, sama At the top, I want to make a quick correction from last month. Last month, I mentioned uh, Jeroid Reedy's tweet about Asahi Super Dry. And uh, I said that he worked for Reuters, but that's incorrect. He actually writes for Bloomberg. So apologies for that. Uh, I can also say that I've, I've seen the new As- Asahi Super Dry can uh, the smart can uh, in person, uh, but only one time, to be honest. And uh, that was at the Moyori Ichi Konbini, which is uh, one of the lesser known konbinis. It generally is at train stations. and But I haven't seen it at any of the regular konbini yet. It's a slim can, it, uh, smart as in Japanese smato. So it's slim. It has about five more ounces than the regular can. Um but for whatever reason, I haven't seen it around very much. So keep an eye out for those because relatively new, should have fresh beer. Um, in the newsletter this month, I wrote about uh, diagramming sentences. But before I get into that, I have to apologize. I make another apology, I should say. Not, uh, not a correction, but I uh, maybe correct a uh, uh, remission uh, that I made in the last podcast, which is that I neglected to mention that we have a publication date for the uh, English translation of the new Murakami novel, uh, The City and Its Uncertain Walls. Uh, I wrote about it in the newsletter uh, last month, so in my defense, uh, I did cover it. I just didn't mention it in the podcast because I already had quite a bit of content, and uh, it also just kind of slipped my mind. Uh, But I'll mention it now, and so that date is November 26, 2024, and the translator is Philip Gabriel, who's done a number of other of Murakami's novels, notably Kafka on the Shore. Uh, They also released the cover for the English edition. It's an okay cover. I think that was the general consensus. Not great. It has a close-up of a wall as the background with the shadows of a couple holding hands kind of projected on the wall. And then Over the top of that are the Roman numerals of a clock in a circle with no hands on the clock. So a lot of nice references to the content of the book, but not sure if they really tie together in the way that some of his other great covers have. Um, The texture of the wall is obviously referring to the wall in the title, the wall in the city or the town that we know from Hubble Wonderland. The shadows refer to the narrator's shadow, which is removed in the town, and the uh, you, your uh, shadow, the woman he ref- the narrator refers to as you, who claims that she's just a shadow when, uh, when the narrator meets her. The more interesting thing than the cover is the publication date. So as I discussed in episode 47, there's going to be a new J. Rubin translation of uh, Murakami's novel, 1985 novel, Hardball Wonderland and the End of the World. And it was initially scheduled for publication on September 17th. I say initially and was because that date is now listed on Amazon as December 10th. I just briefly paused the recording and went to double check Amazon because it, it's been a little while since I put together the material for this podcast and I wanted to double check. And that is indeed still the case, December 10th. Uh, there's still no cover release. It's still this kind of single colored, you know, stock, not stock image, but just stock cover with the title uh, on it. Uh, there hasn't been any real announcement on the Murakami website or through any of Murakami's official social media, uh, which is generally quite active for um announcements in uh, for his translations i would say probably generally farther in advance than uh, his actual novels in japanese you know we only found out about the publication of his most recent novel i think probably about two months before it came out whereas now we know about this new translation seven months before it's coming out um uh but I guess in the end, thinking about how these dates have shifted around, it makes sense. It makes sense for the new translation to go first. It would be, you know, a little bit confusing potentially for readers for a new translation of an old novel to be published 
and then two months later, a, a new novel with a very closely related story, you might kind of end up diluting the market for the new book, which I think, you know, makes sense to give it priority. Um, so I imagine that's also why the marketing push for the Rubin translation hasn't really launched yet, why there is no cover, why there has been no official announcements. So it makes me wonder when and if it will start. Um, it's getting published two weeks after the new novel. Um, so I wonder if they're just kind of planning to kind of keep it real low key and not shadow drop it. I guess you don't want to do something like that for a book, uh, but at least to kind of coast on the wake of the first novel. Um, you have to imagine that at some point they'll put out a cover and do some kind of official announcement, which will inevitably overlap with the press for the new novel, you know, unless they do it literally the day after the new novel gets released. Um, so to be honest, it wouldn't surprise me if that, the J. Rubin translation gets pushed back even further for some reason. If say to, you know, even to 2025 at some point, just purely to kind of give it a little bit more breathing room to do a marketing push for it. I'm, I don't know. It's a, it's a very interesting situation and it makes me a little bit surprised that they put out information about it so far in advance when somebody must have known that both of these things were happening and somebody should have said something to someone about, hey, maybe we should kind of space these apart a little bit further. I mean, maybe they just needed to kind of, you know, legally get something out there the way that, you know, you see often these leaks with video game announcements come from when they get raided in Korea and then news will leak that a certain game received a rating in Korea and that means it's, it's reached a certain p point in development. Um, but in this case, I don't know what to say, to be honest. I have no inside info. It's all speculation as usual. Um, it's just very confusing. I don't know. Um, and uh, I'll be very curious to see how it plays out. I'll be watching uh, and uh, I'll keep you updated. Um, so now to the core of the newsletter this month, uh, I gave into a craving uh, and tried one of McDonald's new bacon potato pies, which I guess is back for a limited period of time. It was on their menu previously for a long, long time and then was uh, taken off and then added back on. And now is a kind of seasonal uh, menu item that uh, comes out every April. And I will admit it is very tasty. Uh, they're kind of the perfect size to give you just enough of a savory hit, but not really fully satisfy you. So I could probably polish off like two or three of them in one sitting and not really think much of it. Uh, the inside is a little bit gloopy. I would say that's my main complaint. So I don't like it as much as their apple pies, which have a little bit more texture. Um, and I have the Edge uh, web browser to thank for learning about this uh uh, the release of this uh, seasonal item. I switched to Edge at some point in the last four to five years. I don't really remember when. I remember uh, I switched because it was supposed to be faster and it, and it, had, it was faster and I, I liked using it, to be honest. I, don't, I, I, I switched recent, more recently to Brave because it's a little bit more, it's better with ads and things like that. But I liked Edge. I still use it uh, at home and at work. Um, and when I started using it on a Japanese computer in 2022, I realized that the Edge homepage has news highlights in Japanese. Like when you click a new tab, the, the kind of default uh, setting is to show you the kind of top hits, the top links that you always go to, to give you a little weather block for the next couple of days, and then to give you various little news headlines in some are in a list form, some have like a little image with a headline and a little subtitle. Um, and you can kind of scroll down and it's a little bit like uh, taking a look at the front page of a newspaper. If that newspaper was made up of entirely of like uh, sports and uh, maybe some politics and then some pop culture and then food, random food items. 
Um, I find it a nice little break, uh, study break to browse these and to kind of like keep in touch with what's going on in the world. Um, and I realized that you can get it to, uh, you can set it in any language that you want, to be honest. So I haven't experimented with it too much, but this really could be good language learning practice for any language. Um, so when you load up the browser, when you load up the Edge browser, open a new tab and see what it shows. Like if you have it set to show like google.com, you're gonna have to change that setting. Um, you have to have it set so that it opens to the Edge new tab page. I think that's what they call it, rather than a specific URL. So if you have if you have your homepage set that way, you, ha you have to go into the settings under the home button and make sure that new tab page is set. And then once you open a new tab page, um, on the upper right hand of the actual like page of content on that new tab page, which would normally be like the New York Times. It would actually be the New York Times website. So it's not on like the browser UI. It's actually on the, the website. There's a gear icon and that's what you want to click. If you click that uh, in the upper right hand of the screen, that gear icon, a little drop down box will give you a few options for this new tab page that are separate from like the browser settings and they include the language and then how this new tab page displays the news it's giving you. Um, so the, the language slash region, you know, can be set to a lot of different options, but the one we want is Nihon Nihongo, Japan, Japanese. And it won't change the language of the browser itself. You know, it'll still be file, you know, and, and, and all the, the menus along the top at least on my Mac, are still in English. But the content of the new tab page and what appears on it is uh, going to be in the language of that language slash region that you selected. And that's what you want. Um, it also shows the weather for your area. You know, I assume that's done by kind of uh, locating where you're browsing from rather than the region that you're selecting. Um, but yeah, let me know, check out other languages. If you're studying Spanish or whatever, you know, Portuguese, set it to that and set it to some other region and see what kind of news it gives you. Um, but once you have that, it's, you can kind of create these little study moments for yourself. If you can train yourself to peruse the headlines. Um, and, uh, the, I guess a good example of the, the kind of content that often gets included is more, rather than like New York Times and sites like that, it's more like kind of like bloggy type content. Like the one that I just read recently is the safe way to handle rice once you've cooked it, which is, I hate to break it to some of you, to freeze it immediately after cooking it and not leaving it at room temperature. Uh, yes, you do want to kind of break it down into individual portions in either saran wrap or some kind of Tupperware, but you want to freeze it almost immediately and not let it sit out at room temperature uh, while it's really hot because that's prime bacteria growing uh, time. Uh, but I find myself drawn to these kind of blog-like articles about, you know, especially the ones about fast food and the latest uh, seasonal combini items. Uh, that for me, for whatever reason, is really... I don't know, interesting or motivational to, to, to look into. And that's kind of how I discovered this bacon potato pie. Um, when you click on one of these articles, it will load up kind of in a Microsoft shell. So the link, the URL is MSN dot something or other, but it's aggregated from some other news source. And I always like to kind of uh, track down the original news source. If, I'm, if I find an article that I'm actually interested in reading so that I can kind of save that URL for later. And I did that on the newsletter. And you can also see, you know, I, I've got pictures of the Edge browser showing what this all looks like, where you're clicking and things like that in the newsletter. So definitely, if my explanation didn't make sense, go go to the newsletter and, and check it out and you can see how to get it set up for yourself. And uh, so as I was reading this article about this bacon potato pie, I found a sentence that, it, not like a remarkable sentence, but I thought it was uh, complex enough and interesting uh, in and of itself that I ended up breaking it down for 
the newsletter this month. And it shows like this kind of relatively new practice for me, which is uh, sentence diagramming. I don't think it's, a, it's not an official thing. It's not something I learned from a teacher. Um, I did diagram sentences in school in English, you know, about how sentences work. I remember doing that in fifth grade. I'm not sure if that's something that is done anymore. It might have kind of gone out of fashion a little bit, but it was an interesting way to think about grammar. And so it was something that I've been doing a little bit in Japanese and I'm still kind of trying to figure out the process for it. So I wrote a little bit about that. And so I'll try and do that here on the podcast as well. It's going to be a little bit more difficult because it's audio and it's a bit of a visual exercise. Um, but let me give it a shot. So here's the sentence that I looked at. It's a little bit long, but stick with it. Uh, because I'll make it simpler. So I'll read it. I'll try and read it twice in Japanese. And you'll have to excuse my pronunciation because it's quite long and I'm sure I'm going to mess up something or stutter at some point. So please forgive me. So here we go. Here's the sentence. Makudonaldo de wa kihon teki ni ichido regular kara hazureta menu ga futatabi regular ni kairi saku koto wa nai no da ga bacon potato pie wa fukkatsu o nozomu koe ga Okay, I'll read that one more time. マクドナルドでは基本的に一度レギュラーから外れたメニューが再びレギュラーに帰り咲くことはないのだが、ベーコンポテトパイは復活を望む声が数多く Okay, so if any of you were able to understand all of that, you probably think I'm pretty ridiculous because this content is ridiculous. It's about the freaking bake, bacon potato pie at McDonald's, the seasonal, you know, fast food item. But it's a nice, like, complex sentence with like lots of different elements and uh, being able to kind of parse this as you read it without like stopping to break it down is our ultimate goal. But if you can't do that yet, how do you get to the point that you can do that? I think that's kind of the main problem I'm trying to solve uh, with this exercise of diagramming sentences. And so uh, one thing that I like to tell people to do when you're if you've got a long sentence that you don't understand, start at the end, uh, start at the very end. And for us, that this sentence, you know, there's an initial clause that ends with no daga, right? But, and then we have another sentence, another clause. Um, and that sentence ends in fukkatsu, and without a verb, just this noun fukkatsu, which means revival, right? Or rebirth or re to bring back. And, uh, but essentially we have a, wa, b, a, wa, b, a, the particle wa, and then b. So on, two different things on each side of this a, wa, b equation. And that, if you act, actually add in what those things are, it's bacon, potato, pie, wa, fukkatsu is the simplest way that you could say what this sentence structure is. Bacon, potato, pie, wa, fukkatsu. There's no verb attached, but it's implied. And that implied verb is sarita, the past uh, tense passive form of sudu. So sarita, it was, this pie was brought back by another actor, by McDonald's. Um, you can say fukatsu shita, right? That is a fukatsu sudu, something that you can do. Like if you eat a big meal and you feel you know brought back to life, that might be something you, you could say, but here, Bacon potato pie wa fukkatsu. So A wa B sarita is maybe how we might sim explain what's going on here. A wa B sarita. And then if we do that same thing for the first half of this sentence structure, it becomes X de wa Y ga. Right? I'm using variables here. X and Y for this first clause, A and B for that second clause that we just looked at. And so overall, we have this structure X de wa Y ga A wa B sarita. X de wa Y ga A wa B sarita. 
So if you were first reading the sentence and you weren't able to kind of parse it down on your first go, if you could try and like really just get rid of as much extra verbiage as you could and, and identify the, really the core elements of the sentence, this is what you would end up with. And you even from this alone, you can kind of get a really good sense of the rhythm of this, how the sentence is working. At X, Y is the case, but as for A, it was bead, right? That's what this structure is essentially suggesting. If you build out the, the skeleton framework a little further with some of the, f the phrases that are kind of working grammatically rather than kind of creating the content of the sentence, you, get to, you start to see how the logic is working. Uh, and that would create this sentence, X dewa Y koto wa nai no da ga A wa C koto kara B. Right, so I've added in two new variables, Y and C, to kind of take the place of other content that's being added in, right? X dewa Y koto wa nai no da ga A wa C koto kara B. So we see that this Y phrase with the Y variable ends with a negative. And then there's a further explanatory bit in that second half of the sentence and that independent clause, which leads us to this meaning. At X, Y does not happen. But as for A, due to C, it was B. Right, so you already have this kind of like flow of, of reasoning that's going on here, right? This this dependent clause on the front half of this sentence is setting up a situation where something does not happen. And then this, the, or actually in, in Japanese, it's, it's in English, it's the opposite, right? So in Japanese, the first half of the sentence is dependent and the second half is independent. Whereas in English, the first half is independent and the second half is dependent, right? The, but because of the way the conjunctions work, um, you get a sense that Right, it's establishing what is what the case is, and then in the second half of this sentence, is establishing an exception to that case and saying what and explaining why something happened. Right, so this is the way this that I'm like translating this right now is not great English and, and definitely not a good translation. But the goal here is to understand like what is going on with the Japanese, how is the Japanese working. And you can really only do that if you're doing this kind of like word for word translation. And that's, that's our goal is to understand it, not to do a, a good translation, right? We could very easily make a good translation. And I've got a decent translation on the newsletter, which I think you'll, I hope you'll check out. Um, so what we really need to do next to kind of build out our understanding of, of what's going on here is to look at Y and C, right? And so Y and C are actually very complex little sentences. And so you can even break them down further. So let, let's try and do that because Y is this phrase, I'll do Y first. Y is, kihonteki ni ichido regular kara hazureta menu ga futatabi regular ni kairisaku. Kihonteki ni ichido regular kara hazureta menu ga Right, so that you could easily turn into another phrase with using the variable Z, and that would be Z ga kairisaku. You could eliminate all the rest of that verbiage, and the main thing that's happening here in the Japanese is Z ga kairisaku. Z returns. Kairisaku means to kind of return. I don't have the kind of full implication of that verb, uh, what it means is how it's, how it's used, but here we know it means returns, right? So we replace this hugely longer phrase Y with ziga kairisaku. And we can do the same thing with the variable C. C is fukkatsu wo nozomu koe ga kazuoku yosedareta. Fukkatsu wo nozomu koe ga kazuoku yosedareta. And if we were turning that into an, another phrase using the variable D, that would be D ga yosedareta. D ga yosedareta. So this, at its very core, the simplest thing being said here is D were delivered slash received, right? A passive form of uh, yoseru. 
right? So that gives us what I kind of think of as the main overall structure of this sentence, kind of like to understand enough of what's going on, yet not do all the core uh, details, right? So we have all the main verbs. We don't have any kind of descriptive uh, phrases and we don't have any of the subjects uh, and or topics marked. Um, and so that phrase is X dewa ziga kairi saku koto wa nai no daga. A wa D ga yosei koto kara B. At X, Z does not return, but as for A, due to D being received, it was B'd. And there's obviously a, a lot more going on in this. There's a lot, there's a lot more little um, adverbs. There's the subjects themselves. Um, there's um, some other small little kind of grammatical pieces um, that are, are going on. And, and those you, you need to kind of plug in. But breaking it down like further would basically kind of be me explaining every single thing. It would kind of defeat the purpose of, of what's going on here, which is finding a way for you to understand sentences that you don't understand without uh, on your own, without too much uh, outside assistance, right? How, how to parse a sentence. And it, the, if the process of elimination is something that can, can help you there, if you can kind of grasp the overall understanding and then start to insert some other language slowly but surely to get to the full sentence, I think that's a good way to do it. How can you kind of suss out the structure of the sentence and understand what's going on. So that's my, I think, kind of goal moving forward. I wanna see how this kind of sentence diagramming is effective for me as a writer, I think. Um, is it something where I can like find sentence structures that are interesting and uh, kind of put my own verbiage in them uh, to make uh, unique uh, ideas and uh, unique ways of saying things, even though the fundamental structure is, you know, very common. Um, so yeah, go ahead and check out the newsletter for a full translation of the sentence uh, and to look at uh, closer at some of the verbiage. Uh, that was the main thing I want to write about. Um, I, I'll, I'm very curious to track this going forward. So so I'll, I'll, if, if there's anything else that I, I find from this process that uh, I, I will be sure to note it again. Um, and then I have a little bit of Iro Iro to, to, to include this month. Um, check out the newsletter again. Another great reason to check it out is because I include one of my, my favorite recipes I've discovered on TikTok recently. TikTok is, is still an obsession. I still probably scroll probably, I, I'm, pr I'm better about it than I was before, but I would say I'm still probably doing at least 30 minutes to an hour every day. And recipe uh, finding is still one of the best reasons to to get on TikTok. And the most recent recipe is a baked sweet potato top with stir fried chickpeas and spinach with a tahini dressing. And I just use a neri goma sesame paste here in J Japan. And it calls for sesame paste, soy sauce, maple syrup, and then lime juice. I just use lemon juice. You kind of mix that all up. And I cook them in the microwave in like five, 10 minutes. And, and it's like done. You can have dinner, and then while it's cooking in the microwave, I can stir fry the chickpeas and the spinach, and uh, in a little bit of oil, and then uh, once that's done, mix up the dressing, and it's like dinner in fifteen minutes. It's kind of incredible. You just have to be able to get the chickpeas, which I've been getting at Gyomu Supa, the Gyomu Gyomu supermarket, uh, so industry supermarket. I guess it's like. I, I guess technically you're supposed to be in the industry if you shop there, but they don't ever check anything. It's just basically a regular super, but they've got frozen chickpeas for pretty cheap. And you can also get cans of chickpeas at places like Seijo Ishii and things like that. And so those cook up really quick. Um, and uh, I, one other little observation about TikTok, which is uh, something I don't like about TikTok is how much uh, plagiarism happens there. I mean, it seems like there was a moment for plagiarism on YouTube in the last couple of months when H Bomber guy put up his video about plagiarism on YouTube. And if you haven't watched it yet, I, I encourage you to go watch it because it's really incredible uh, what he was able to kind of expose. 
And you see very similar stuff on TikTok. There's so much stolen content in so many uh, different forms and to so many different degrees. Uh, some of it being straight up plagiarism and other being kind of like writing the trend. Um, the best example of this in recipe TikTok uh, is just people finding a trending recipe, uh, putting up their own version and not giving any credit to the original creator. Um, in the last couple months, the recipes that I've noticed go viral are protein bagels made with Greek yogurt, uh, takikomi rice uh, with sweet potato, uh, which is also an excellent uh, quick little recipe, uh, but one that I saw several different accounts do without really any attribution. Um, and then pulled slash scrambled eggs, omelets, where you just kind of like you pour them into a really hot pan and then uh, kind of turn it. So it turns into this like omelet. You see it at, at Japanese uh, omurice restaurants. You can either get the traditional omurice or a kind of turned one where the eggs aren't flipped, but they turn, uh, they're turned and they turn into this nice little like kind of circular pattern. Uh, and then the other recipe I noticed was dessert focaccia in addition to this sweet potato recipe, which I saw on a couple different accounts. Uh, some creators are better than others about attribution, but you know, when you're using TikTok, I'd say go in skeptical. And then uh, the most recent non-recipe trend I noticed was that uh, Kawase Hasui's art is being aggregated into TikTok posts. Uh, he's a Shin Hanga artist, really great um, kind of... Uh, uh, 20th century artist. Uh, I think he was alive until around the 60s. Uh, the Sh uh, Art Institute of Chicago has a lot of his prints, which are great. Uh, that's kind of where I uh, got to know him. Uh, but you see a lot of his stuff on Twitter too. Accounts just kind of tweeting out his images. And I was always a little skeptical of that, but I guess a lot of his stuff is in the public domain now. So it's kind of fair use. Uh, it, it still seems like lazy content. Um, and and it's, even if it's not, in as much of a legal gray zone as these TikTok accounts that are just kind of posting clips from movies or sports sporting events. So um, yeah, I don't like it, but I'm still using TikTok for the recipes. Um, another little dose of Iro Iro is that I noticed the J-drama Brush Up Life is, uh, I don't know if it's recently or not, but I noticed that it's on Netflix now and it's being advertised on Netflix and it has uh, in, an English translation. It's been translated as rebooting. Uh, it was my favorite Japanese drama of the last couple of years. And I really don't want to give much of a plot description because doing so would really ruin some of the fun of watching the show. But I will say that it's kind of loosely Groundhog Day adjacent. Uh, and it's set in the 90s and 2000s and is centered around a couple of Japanese women. So anyone with nostalgia for uh, Japanese culture, especially J-pop during that time, the, the 90s and early 2000s, uh, you're going to love this show. You've got to watch it. Um, and you can actually watch it for free on Tiver right now as well. Uh, it's I think it might still be uh, in that period of time. Often on Tiver, right, you can watch each episode for one week from the day it airs, and then it it gets turned off. But then... Several months later, once the show has been off the air for several months, they'll have like, I don't know how long, maybe a month or two where you can watch all every episode from the series for free. So it's basically essentially like rebroadcast. So uh, and uh, TV is something you can access with a VPN. And the writer of that show, if you if you like that show and you, and you like that kind of writing, uh, it was written by this guy named Baka Rhythm. I guess that's a pen name, but that's kind of like what he goes by. Uh, he's got a great show available on Hulu in Japan. I don't think it's been translated. It came out in 2017 and it's titled Kaku Oeru Nikki. So the kind of fictional office lady's diary. And I'm really, really curious to hear other people's opinions on this show. It's very like Seinfeld in that it's kind of a show about nothing. It just follows a group of office ladies who work at a bank. Uh, Baka Rhythm himself plays the protagonist uh, he, as as himself, kind of. He's cross-dressing in women's clothing, but otherwise he's not really doing anything to change his appearance. He's not wearing a wig. He's not, like, acting too girly. He, he kind of does a little bit uh, of, puts on a little bit of an effeminate voice, but not really, not much at all. Doesn't wear any makeup, no wig, doesn't, you know, maybe changes his voice just slightly, but not much. Uh, 
and even his kind of the the acting itself is pretty light uh, but it's a, a really kind of wonderful, hilarious little look inside this oil culture and this this group of women who work at this bank. But the ending, I'm really curious to hear what people make of the ending. It's not a plot based ending. So there's no twist or suspense. It doesn't really build up to anything, but it does something interesting with the entire conceit of the show. And I'm really curious to see what people make of it and how they interpret it because I was just kind of taken aback after having spent, you know, six or seven hours with these women, what he did with the ending. I wasn't quite sure how to take it. So um, if you happen to uh, watch that, let me know what you think. Uh, post a comment, send me an email, howtojapanese at gmail.com. I'd be curious to know. And um, that's all I got for you this month. Check out uh, the newsletter, check out the blog. I'm still working on the blog post uh, as I record this, but it's going to be about another little um, article I found via Edge, uh, the Edge browser, one of these other little articles I was looking at when I was uh, should have been writing or reading, uh, uh, doing something at home and was instead looking at uh, this Japanese news article. So check that out too. Hope you all had a nice Hanami. It was a a little bit late here in uh, Kansai, but it, we had a couple nice little weekends that didn't get totally rained out. And I uh, uh, hope you all were able to find some time and space for that as well. And I'll see you next month.